Hello and good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, another Land Effects webinar. Uh, this is Jake, and we have another fun, special webinar for you guys today. Um, this is going to be presented by our one and only Jeremiah Farmer, uh, CEO of the company. And uh, it's always fun having him present some of these webinars. Uh, so I, I don't want to take up too much time. So we want to just cover a few house cleaning items before we get started. This is being recorded. So if you guys want to um, check this out afterwards, if you missed anything, want to go back on anything, it is being recorded and will be posted uh, later today. So you can go to our website and under webinars, see this recording. Um, we do encourage questions. We love the conversations back and forth. This is being recorded live, so it is fun uh, to be able to chat with us and uh, see what we can actually answer for you live. So there is a Q&A button that you can go ahead and click and open up so that you can have that geared up and ready to go. Uh, we do also have a chat window. We ask that you try and refrain from asking questions in the chat. Um, but that's more for side banter and just little comments back to one another. It's fun to have you guys chat with one another as well. We do have a, a great little list of people here today or long list of people here today. So it's fun to see all ranges of experience here. Um, if you do find yourself in full screen mode, there is a view options up at the top of your screen that you should be able to um, exit out or escape out of so that you can minimize and move over to the side if you need to, to see other things. So without any further ado, I want to turn this over to Jeremiah. Well, thank you, Jake. Hi, everybody. How are we doing here? We are going to be talking about the ADA today. And uh, um, I'm I have to admit, I'm a little nervous. I'm so sorry, <laughs> but um, I, cause it's more, look at this list of attendees. I mean, I've got kind of this who's who of, you know, landscape architecture firms represented uh, some of the, some prestigious and powerhouse and notable firms. And I'm really honored that you're here and I'm petrified that I'm not going to meet your standards, but I'm going to do my best. Um, yeah. I'm, you know, you, you know, me as being with land effects, um, I don't have any necessarily bona fide ADA qualifications here. Uh, my dad is a landscape architect, and I remember growing up in his office, I remember when the ADA passed, and he said words to the effect of uh, something like, about frickin' time, is I believe how he put it, and I certainly share that sentiment. Um, I've always just been a passionate advocate for it and, and have really enjoyed um, seeing it move along. And so I'm here to give you um, a, a talk about it from that sort of 30,000 foot high point of view. You know, I do have a degree in politics and I think, I, you know, this presentation is definitely, you know, going to be a little more, um, you know, that sort of a discussion, discussion of the history of the ADA and, and uh, the political ramifications of it. And absolutely, as it pertains to landscape architecture, um, but, you know, I'm not really getting into these nitty gritty ADA, ADA building codes, you know, that you guys know backwards and forwards, um, um, really more talking about it more in this general sense, as if we're just rapping about the ADA. And I brought along for the ride, uh, my buddy Aaron from college, uh, met him in college, and we've been buddies for years. And I just could not even imagine, you know, researching this, preparing this webinar without him. And so I asked him to join us along for the ride. Um, Aaron, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, um, my name is Aaron Spencer. Uh, I have been a lifelong wheelchair user and um, advocate for the disabled. I, uh, I've read the ADA forwards, backwards, and inside out. I served on the Santa Cruz County Commission on Disabilities for 10 years. Um, and uh, I'm really stoked to be here today and uh, supporting Jer and having a conversation about uh, one of my lifelong passions. Great. And did, I, I believe at some point I did promise that you would have the ability to yell at architects. So, um, well, <laughs> we might still be able to carve that in here. <laughs> <laughs> um, as for the agenda, I mean, these, this is more the this is more the agenda of the generalized sort of themes we're going to be covering here. Um, 
And, but like I said, I, I'm gonna really, we're, we're talking about, you know, what's the history of the ADA? Um, where does it, from a legal standpoint, you know, it's been 30 years, what, what, what's the next 30 years gonna hold? Let's, let's chat about that. Um, absolutely, and, and you know, I can't see your faces. Please feel free to chime in in that Q&A, um, just to let me know if I'm striking a nerve or if I'm, you know, really, you know, give me a thumbs up, you name it. Um, it's, it's nice to get sort of feedback to know where I stand with you. But I, I really do feel I've got the right audience here. I must be preaching to the choir. You're landscape architects. You have I feel embraced the ADA more than any other discipline and, and and as I'm preparing this I saw this letter to the editor that Reef wrote to Landscape Architecture magazine and you know he states you know you have to understand ADA in order to practice landscape architecture absolutely true and look and, and that that was an aside it's not even his main point yes you guys get it you understand the ADA so I, I think you're the perfect audience for this so let's just kind of dive into this and, and see where it goes, right? Well, first we need to find the ADA. And, and you know, as you know the ADA, it's right, it's those binders that are in your office, right? <laughs> I guarantee every single one of you has those ADA binders of all the continuing building codes and, and ramp codes and everything. And, and, and that's your life that you live. Well, I'm going to step back for a bit and, and, and you know, define and talk about you know, the actual law itself. Um, but, but I want to start with this picture. Um, what is the ADA? This picture, I kept coming back to this photo as I was preparing this webinar. And, and you know, that's why I chose it for the title slide. It, this to me in every way, shape and form so encapsulates the ADA in a single photo. Um, let me explain to you what I see in this photo and see if you agree with me, okay? First, it's obvious that the building was built long before the ramp. So the ramp was definitely added after the fact. Uh, it doesn't match. Um, the choice of masonry doesn't match. The <laughs> railing color is a horrible choice. Um, it looks, it looks frankly like it was added cheaply and hastily, um, like a lot of ADA ramps, right? Um, maybe I'm projecting a little bit there. Uh, you know, maybe the building owner was happy to add it, but as we all know, too often with ADA, the building owner fought kicking and screaming, maybe even had to be dragged into court in order to get them to add that ramp. Um, maybe that happened, maybe not. But all I know is what is fact here is after whatever did per happen when this ramp is finally here, look at this young lady. She could have gone up those steps, but she chose to take the ramp. It could have been a, a mom with a stroller, right? Could have been, you know, after all of the infighting, after all of that, you know what? The ramps are just simply pleasant. Um, and if it was done right, it would be even better. You know, the awning, why doesn't the awning extend over the ramp? Why isn't the masonry better? You know, if you actually made this a part of that entryway, it would be far more inviting. And, and that's really what the end goal of the ADA is, is let's make this just part of what we do, not this hastily added tack on. Um, and, but of course, as we know the ADA, it is a little bit of both, right? Um, but let's get into the actual nitty gritty. What is the ADA? It's a law that was passed in 1990, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, it fundamentally continued um, off of this bit of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 called Section 504. Section 504, uh, prohibited discrimination against the disabled for any federal uh, funding. And so the ADA of 1990 um, used the exact same language, absolutely intended to carry that on, now prohibits discrimination for disability in all areas of public life, very specifically all areas of public life. So not just federal money now, now just everything in public life. It establishes, establishes these accessibility requirements on all public accommodations, uh, but with a very strong focus on employment opportunities. And this is very key. Uh, the, very much the mindset of it was that, well, if all these businesses were accessible, then there wouldn't be such a high unemployment rate among the disabled. Um, and further, though, it's, it's also a tad unique um, in that, uh, well, you know, of course, any 
any law, any person could be challenged via a civil lawsuit, but the ADA is very notable in that that, that is really the big enforcement mechanism of the ADA is these lawsuits whether they come from the government or even just individual um, people, individual disabled people can, can sue um, under the ADA. And um, this is unique because fundamentally, certainly for, for us, uh, the ADA is, is an infrastructure bill, right? Um, it's basically saying that you need ramps everywhere. But unlike an infrastructure bill, there's no funding mechanism. It doesn't say here's, you know, x billion dollars to put those ramps in it just says you know you need it to be accessible or else you'll get sued um is, is effectively what what the ada says so it's my word if this threat of lawsuit is the quote-unquote funding mechanism so that is um rather unique and um but to really appreciate it um let me kind of frame it and and let's frame it really kind of how a a a, a trial judge would see it. I mean, because that's fundamentally what we're talking is we're talking this ADA lawsuit could happen. Well, what does a judge think of when they see a lawsuit? They see this hierarchy of, of our canon of laws and rights. And, and it really begins here with the Bill of Rights. And you know, I'm not going to belabor the Bill of Rights. You know, we know this, but you know, fundamentally the Bill of Rights are separating the government from the people, you know, giving us these individual rights of speech and religion, assembly, uh, protecting us from search and seizure, giving us the right to a jury trial, really, really keeping that government at distance, but establishing the rights of the people. Okay. Um, but that wasn't complete. Now, was it? Of course, we, we, we'd kind of forgotten a, a whole segment of society. Um, and so 100 years later, after a very, very bloody civil war, uh, we get the 14th Amendment passed. And so now, yes, okay, former slaves, they're no longer these half, you know, three fifths citizens with with no rights no of course they are full citizens with equal rights established okay so now okay now blacks are actually citizens great you know we're moving forward right we're moving forward um but as we all know that that wasn't really the way now was it i mean it took another hundred years it took us to lose another president. Um, um, I, I don't know if, if we're all clear, but I mean, just to restate the obvious, the magnitude of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is so huge. I mean, you realize we lost a president. Um, um, this was JFK's signature domestic policy agenda. And Lyndon Johnson picks it up and, and uses the mourning of JFK to get the Civil Rights Act past. This is a giant, giant step forward for our country, prohibiting discrimination on the basis of race and color and religion and sex. Um, that discrimination is wrong. And, you know, maybe JFK would have made it a constitutional amendment, but, you know, who knows? Um, I just know that, you know, Lyndon Johnson did the right thing here, and he pushes this forward. And through extreme resistance, do you recall the Senate filibustered the Civil Rights Act for 90 days. That is an extremely long time. Um, there was strong interest against this. And this was a hard, hard, hard fought battle. And that becomes now this law. Okay, so now, yes, now Blacks and, and, and no discrimination against anything, religion, sex, or anything. Well, there's also other people, right? There's other people who go, well, what about us? I feel we're discriminated against. And so, well, we have to keep going, right? Um, we then get the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Now, the Rehabilitation Act covers a lot of things. It's mostly known as establishing some affirmative action requirements for federal agencies. But there also is this Section 504, which now says, oh, in the same way that we kind of just ended discrimination against Blacks, now we're saying you can't discriminate against people with disabilities. They're people, too. We're moving forward. This is great. But it does what it can. And it basically just says you cannot discriminate against people with disabilities in any federal money. Anytime there's federal money attached, you can't discriminate against disabilities. Well, that's great, but that's only a very, very small part of our society. And so the fight continues, and the fight continues to finally get the ADA passed in 1990. Now, using again that exact same language, it's absolutely menaced this sequel to Section 504, now using the exact same language, saying, okay, 
now you cannot discriminate against the disabled in all areas of public life. So that's great. We're moving forward. But again, like I said, no funding mechanism. Um, still a huge fight. You know, the, the Chamber of Commerce said that the ADA, if passed, would uh, signal the, the end of small business as we know it. You know, a little hyperbolic, you think? Um, did it? No, of course not. Um, but it did create a lot of lawsuits, a lot of confusion, right? And there was even some Supreme Supreme Court decisions that literally said, you know, asking the Congress to clarify, you know, what they mean by a disability. And, and that is then what they do with the ADA Amendments Act in 2008, very much broadens the term. So in, instead of slowing down or rolling it back, the ADA Amendments Act says, yeah, a, a, a disability doesn't have to be a permanent thing. It doesn't have to be a debilitating thing, um, just a disability, and really lowers the bar for how what would get a successful lawsuit. Um, still, though, no funding. It, it's, it doesn't throw in a bunch of federal money into this, unfortunately. Um, but it, you know, is definitely a huge step forward, and effectively is a, a an accelerator pad on these lawsuits. Um, but leaving us to where we are now, um, are we there yet? No, of course we're not. We're not there yet. We're in this weird, fuzzy period. Um, we're still waiting on some things from the top down. We're waiting on currency. We're certainly waiting on residential. You know, we've got federal level and we've got public level, but we don't have private level. We're still waiting for residential and we're just waiting for adoption in general. Is every place accessible? No. You know, when is this going to happen? We're literally just kind of in this weird holding phase where basically waiting for someone or some entity to fight the fight to take us to the next step. We are in the process of this constant evolution of it, and, and we'll see where it goes. Um, I, I want to put a quick plug in for these three movies. Uh, if you're like me, you enjoy cinema. And I just particularly love historical movies because they are the next best thing to actual time travel. Uh, if you missed Crip Camp, it was a very recent documentary. Uh, it missed out on a theatrical release during COVID, uh, but you can stream it. It is a fantastic, fantastic documentary. And it really shows the, you know, shows the actual people and showing that fight of, of after Section 504 got passed and charging towards getting the ADA, you know, um, and it's just a really wonderful documentary. I uh, can't recommend it enough. And if you haven't seen Music Within, that one too, please rush out and go see it. Um, it is, shows the life story of Richard Pimentel, who is generally considered the architect of the ADA. Uh, he is a disabled Vietnam veteran, and he dedicated his life to getting uh, jobs for disabled Vietnam veterans. He literally wrote the book on employing the disabled, actually more than one book. <laughs> he briefed every imaginable government agency on employing the disabled, and it was absolutely his influence, his writing very much influenced the language and the direction of the ADA. Um, his influence on it cannot possibly be understated or overstated. Um, so really great movie to see that, you know, see what it was really like. And, and just lastly, Born the Fourth of July. And, you know, if you've seen it, you might be thinking, what the heck does that have to do with the ADA? Well, uh, uh, let me tell you is it shows particularly the impact of the disabled Vietnam veterans. And they were very loud and boisterous and gunning for a fight and fighting to end the war, fighting to get basic rights. And they joined this fight and were absolutely instrumental in getting Section 504 passed and getting the ADA passed. But also the beautiful thing about that particular movie is it was created just before the ADA was passed. The movie Born on the Fourth of July is a beautiful little time capsule to 1989. Every scene where they have, you know, all these actors in wheelchairs and as they're as they're moving around and doing their different things, you're seeing what America was like before the ADA. And you will notice, like I did, all these little things, you're like, oh look, you know, that's not compliant. That's not compliant. And it's just this wonderful little um, little time travel into that time period of time. So um, that being said. Um, but one of the things uh, that those movies really showed well in that uh, documentary Crip Camp, they showed the Capitol Crawl. Uh, this was a media event that was 
put on to get the ADA passed. It had languished for literally years. And this event was staged where all these individuals, they left their wheelchairs at the base of the Capitol steps and crawled to the top. It took hours for some of them, as you can imagine. Um, the, the, if, if that's not a gut punch to you, I don't know what is. It certainly was the Congress. It finally got them to approve the ADA. Um, and, and yeah, to think that you would require any, any aspect of society to crawl up 300 steps to get some basic human rights, um, it, that should be a gut punch to you. Uh, but you know, this, it has been a fight everything has been a fight, every little step forward regarding disability rights. And as I said, after the ADA was passed, um, it became a matter of the courts. Um, so now it gets really shaped by these court decisions. You know, out of the gate, we had a couple of real notable Supreme Court decisions that limited the scope of the ADA. Uh, the one in 2002, a lot of us were watching that. Um, it said that the ADA only applied to physical structures, not to websites. Uh, and But then in 2002, we got a win against the city of Sacramento that, yes, sidewalks are covered. And that's a classic example. In the law, the ADA law, it doesn't say the word sidewalks anywhere. Um, so it's a matter for the courts to decide. So we have this court decision that, yes, obviously a sidewalk is part of the public life. And so now we get all these sidewalks lowered at every crossing. Um, then we had, a, you know, in 2002, unfortunately, we had a loss against Southwest Airlines. So again, another judgment that the um, ADA does not apply to websites, which is really unfortunate because it's exceedingly easy and inexpensive to make a website accessible. Um, but in 2005, we had a great win against Norwegian Cruise Line. This one always makes me giggle a little. Uh, Norwegian Cruise Line, their defense literally was because we flag our ships in Panama specifically to get out of American labor laws, we'd also like to get out of American accessibility laws. And luckily they lost. So taking a cruise is a little less miserable because everything is accessible. It's really nice. Um, and then 2007 against UPS, uh, this one, just crazy, uh, a collection of deaf employees of UPS sued UPS because the fire alarms in their sorting facilities were audible only. They didn't have any sort of visual blinking red light. And instead of just putting in some blinking red lights, UPS says, go ahead and sue me. They lose, they, well, there was a civil settlement. I guarantee you that settlement cost far more than if they had just put in some blinking red lights. But a, a, just a great example of how this ADA advances, right? So, you know, is it building code that a fire alarm has to have a blinking red light? Not quite, but it's getting there. And this is helping to form those building codes. Um, you know, so the same way that we're now adding carbon monoxide detectors to everything, are you know, all um, fire alarms going to have to have blinking red lights at some point? Absolutely. There's going to be another lawsuit that's going to make that happen. Um, then this is then where the ADA Amendments Act comes in in 2008. Um, but then we also have another settlement now regarding uh, another website. So at least it was a settlement. Uh, but still, um, I'm not, I haven't followed up. I don't know if Target did go back and just upgrade their website. Hopefully they did. Uh, but then also in 2008, we had another landmark decision, Par Michigan Paralyzed Veterans of America versus University of Michigan. They just wanted to go watch a football game you know, root on their team. And they felt that having all the handicapped parking and the disabled seating and accessible concessions was just in one area of the stadium. And they felt that was discriminatory and they were right. They absolutely won that. Um, a Supreme Court has established multiple times, separate is not equal. And especially with ADA, that is a huge, huge lesson to learn regarding the ADA separate is not equal. It you has to be integrated as part of the society, part of the design. Um, but then ending regarding websites, it is still not the law in the United States to have websites be accessible. Uh, the EU is kind of taking 
the charge here. They are now passing these laws that typically the United States was leading, um, those regarding privacy and, and right to your own data um, and accessibility. So it is the law in the EU that every website uh, must be accessible, that um, is someone with vision impairment must be able to navigate that website. It is not difficult to do to a website. Uh, of course, we've done that to ours. And, it, and it's just a wildly unfortunate that not only is it not the law, but just that any provider would not simply make their website accessible, especially because it's the law in the EU and every federal website has to be. So it's not like this is a difficult thing to do. So still waiting on that to just be codified into a law. And while we wait, here is your poster child of the ADA fight right here. Um, very famous around these parts, uh, Northern California, anyone in the, in, the, in the disabled community knows Scott Johnson. He is the general and lieutenant and soldier all rolled into one. He's the one fighting the fight. Uh, he is a attorney and he files ADA lawsuits. And take a look at this headline though, you know, serial ADA filer, because he's filed thousands of these lawsuits. Oh, and we, they have to mention, of course, right? They have to mention he's indicted. Ooh, he's an indicted attorney in a totally unrelated tax case. Um, wow, could this headline be any more demonizing? Um, let me fix this for them, if I may. Okay, how about how about this? How about 1,000 serial ADA neglectors were served with paperwork by this noble servant of the court? Hmm? Is that a little better? Because that's what's actually going on. <laughs> Let's keep in mind, the ones breaking the law here are the 1,000 people that are still not accessible. And, and this absolutely is this stigma of the ADA. He's the bad guy? And it's absolutely, unfortunately, that way. Look at this, even in the media, it's so unfortunate. I even looked into this. You know what? Okay, I'm going to research how many of those thousand companies went out of business. You know what I found? I could only find this one, Panda Dumpling. Panda Dumpling puts this note on the door. Look at that. Oh, we're closed permanently due to ADA lawsuit. Hmm, really? Was that really why you went out of business, Panda Dumpling? Let's look into this. First of all, been there 20 years? Sounds like you were kind of thinking about retiring. Not only that, there was a little thing called a pandemic and your business dropped. So are you, but you're gonna mention the ADA lawsuit. That's what people are gonna see as they walk by and they see that on the door and they're gonna think, oh, darn the ADA, right? That's what happens. It is 100% a lie, and that's unfortunate. Let's look at that complaint that they claim is why it went out of business. Scott said their counters were too high. They didn't have a lowered counter for him to order. There's no grab bars in the toilet stall, and all their tables were too low for a wheelchair. That put them out of business. You're telling me a table? You go to Ikea, get a table, get a, get a grab bar. You know, yes, the counter is going to cost some money, okay, maybe a few thousand dollars, right, at most to try to, to put in a lowered counter. But you're telling me to put in a few thousand dollar little renovation in your business, that was your bridge too far? That is an abject lie. That is not what happened. But again, this is the stigma of the ADA. And it's so, so, so unfortunate. Also unfortunate is the top down. I'm gonna have a quick little sidebar on currency, um, mainly because, well, for a few reasons, but you know, it's helpful to have top down, right? And be nice if the federal government was fully on board. Well, they're not regarding currency. Now it's technically not specifically an ADA issue. When the American Council for the Blind sued the treasury department, uh, they sued them for violating section 504 because that is what they did, right? Section 504 said the federal government cannot discriminate against the disabled, um, whereas the ADA applies to the full public sector of life. So that is the correct lawsuit to challenge the treasury department on. But yes, 504 and the ADA are part of the same canon of law. 
Uh, they did win in 2006. I love this judge's decision. Oh my gosh. Um, of the more than 180 countries that issue paper currency, only the United States prints bills that are identical in size and color. Uh, come on. Every single country has this figured out and not us. The Treasury Department, uh, that's under George W. Bush, they appealed that decision and then they lost again in 2008. And this judge excoriated them. Secretary does not explain why US currency should be any different than any other country. Of course not, of course not. And they still dragged their feet all the way into 2015. That's when they announced a $10 bill with Harriet Tubman on it. And not even as part of the announcement, hidden on like, it's like page three or something of their, the, the announcement of that new note. They happened to notice it said, in addition to these security features it was going to have, right? It was going to have some Braille. It was going to be the first note with Braille. It was really heralded in the community. But then not too long to celebrate because in 2016, that Broadway hit Hamilton came out and everyone thought, oh, well, you can't replace Hamilton with Harriet Tubman. And so the Treasury Department just drops the plans completely. Uh, so it's really unfortunate. And, you know, the critics are winning. Uh, the critics along the line were saying, if you were to add Braille to our notes, that would cost $4 billion just to upgrade our vending machines which, you know, I, I hope you see that and you realize that is the most asinine BS possible statement, right? First of all, it's a vending machine. If a vending machine owner has any expense whatsoever, they just simply raise the prices of the items in the vending machine. It's a zero cost thing. And in fact, it probably most that certainly is zero cost because most of those vending machine operators um, have their credit card processor. The payment box is a whole separate box that can just swap out. I bet the credit card processor would probably for free just swap out that payment module. Um, so, you know, it might cost the credit card processors a little money, but then they too would pass that cost along. It, the cost would be passed along. To claim that there's this missing $4 billion um, is total hyperbole. And it's just, it, it's just sad when, when, you, when you read things like that. But there is a silver lining to this story. In classic ADA fashion, the struggle of waiting for some political will, waiting for someone to do the right thing, someone has stepped up to do the right thing. President Biden has ordered the Treasury Department to accelerate the $20 Harriet Tubman, which will have Braille. It will replace Andrew Jackson. And I guarantee there will not be a Broadway hit glorifying Andrew Jackson. So we have a really good chance that finally this will happen, probably within as close as a year or two, we're going to have this new $20 bill with Braille. So we can have steps forward. It just takes some political will. Hey, so let's have a quick talk about parking. You know, let's bring it back to stone cold ADA, stone cold landscape architecture. Come on, you know, if I was asked how many of y'all have designed a parking lot, I, every one of you is gonna raise your hand, right? Okay, so let's talk about parking. We know, we know the issue, it's this. I tried to find something more attractive, but I just find this, this same chart everywhere. So you, you must have this, right? Everyone has this. Here's, here's the number of handicapped parking spots that a parking lot requires, minimum number. Uh, basically starting at about 4% and then it drops down to 2%. You know, so for you know, any realistic sized parking lot that you're going to when you go to get donuts or whatever, you know, you're looking at one or maybe two handicapped spots, um, which, you know, very easily those can be full, right? That's the issue. And, and, you know, I was just kind of pondering what comment do I have on this? What direction can we talk about accessible parking? And here's where it got me thinking because I drive an EV and it got me thinking about EV parking. And so I went and I looked up what is the EV parking regulation here and, and here in San Luis Obispo. And I found this. And um, this one's interesting. You know, let's, let's look at just the 25 spot you know, kind of call them. They want three EV ready spaces. And to them, EV ready means the circuit has to be already in place and the wiring through the conduit has to be there. Uh, but it doesn't have to put in a charger at the spot. 
Um, but you just have to basically, the, the, the cabling and the circuit has to be there. Uh, EV capable means just simply the conduit, just empty conduit run to that parking spot. Uh, unfortunately, neither of those uh, have a requirement on the width of the parking spot. Uh, they're putting these in the compact spots when, you know, if you've ever driven an EV and tried to charge it, it sure would be nice to have a little space on each side of that parking spot to get that charge cable to the car. Uh, so unfortunately, even these standards are wildly misguided. But of course, look, we've got three EV ready for a 25 spot, 50% EV capable. Clearly, from a numbers standpoint, they're far more interested in that climate change um, issue than in addressing the needs of the disabled. And it got me thinking, there really is overlap. And found in the wild was this cool photo. And this was exactly my thought, and this is entirely my point. I, I'm seeing a solution here. I'm throwing this out there to you guys. Um, I see a tremendous overlap between the needs of handicapped parking and the needs of EV charging parking. And it is that extra space that's necessary and you can have it shared kind of between the two. A couple issues with this, well, really one issue is that, you know, that cable cannot in any way uh, mess up the ramp for the van. Um, so, uh, I, I feel that's a little wrong that that cable needs to be uh, recoiling automatically like a vacuum cord, you know, but otherwise I think this is a really novel solution um, because frankly we need more handicaps parking, more handicaps parking spots, but another way to do it is what, what if we just put in these wide EV parking spots. And, and allow a handicap placard to also park there. That's what I'm kind of throwing out there as a possibility. You know, that is certainly something to consider, you know, but as you are approaching these, these issues with building owners and with the cities and discussing these standards, because I know the standards are variable. Um, I tried to find an article I remember reading years and years ago that Las Vegas casinos were putting in far more than 2% handicap parking. Um, and I just couldn't, I couldn't find the article or the reference, but they, they were just finding that the 2% minimum was, was far too low. And so they are putting in more. And that is fundamentally what we're talking about. We need more. And if you ever need statistics, if you need some statistics to tell that building owner, to tell the city why 2% is not enough, I found this Accessible Parking Coalition. They have so many good statistics and studies that they've done on parking. And I mean, basically, this is all fiddle faddle. Let me just laser beam in on it. Guess what they found, people? They found that there's not enough handicap parking. That's simple. And they found that, you know, over half the time, in fact, when someone needs a handicap parking spot, they're unable to find it. And so the question is, is that discrimination? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Quite literally the million dollar question, because if someone is discriminated against, they can sue and they will. Um, here's our hero of the parking situation, Tim here. I don't wanna take him. I know he could crush me. Look at this guy, another, another veteran fought for his country all he wants is a handicapped parking spot. Well, that's all he wants, but you know, in this regard. And he found that the police were not issuing parking citations for people parked in handicapped parking. If you can't rely on the police, who can you rely on? I guess he's the cop for this. Now, this is more of the insanity of these issues. We'll talk about an easy court win for him, but also that just strikes to it. If someone, you know, like Tim or Scott there feels that every handicapped spot is full and they feel that's discrimination, they can and will file a lawsuit. And that is the discussion to have with your city agencies is that there's just not enough and let's find a solution. Unfortunately, there's this drive to making every spot compact sized, right? got to get as many parking spots as possible. That's all that anyone ever talks about. And it's going to result in another lawsuit. And so we've got to find a better solution. You know, unfortunately, we've been praying at the altar of the automobile for 100 years. And 
instead of putting in more bicycle paths more pedestrian paths more walkable communities so we're really up against the wall here i don't have the perfect solution you know I, i've thrown out a couple of these ideas of mine i don't know you've got some ideas on it please throw something in the q a box and and let's chat about it more um, but it is a problem and and it's going to continue my segue out of parking um I don't know if you saw this tweet a few years ago. Uh, Daniel here, it went, it went a little bit viral and that was cute, but Daniel tweeted, uh, disabled parking should only be valid during business hours, nine to five, Monday to Friday. Cannot see any reason why people with genuine disabilities would be out beyond these times. Um, that's horrifically offensive, Daniel, thank you. Um, Jennifer held back when she's all, we're disabled, you know, we're not werewolves. <laughs> um, but you know, let's do a little word switch here S see if this is offensive as it is to me um how about this uh i cannot see any reason why black people would be out beyond nine to five monday to friday does that sound offensive to you it should it is that's horrible you know daniel i i don't know what you're thinking dude that was messed up uh but um even though he was for whatever reason thinking and talking about parking when I think of what happens outside of nine to five, Monday to Friday, I don't think of parking. I think of housing. I think of home life, residential life, private life, the entire segment of our life, 100% neglected by the ADA. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about housing because we're, we, we're at some point going to address it, right? At some point, there's going to be another ADA Amendments Act addressing residential and housing. And that's what we're going to talk about. Um, I'm going to take a quick little tack at this. I mean, a billion ways to talk about it. I'm going to take just one quick tack, specifically looking at single family housing. Um, I was recently in the market for a house. And this one came across and I ended up kind of researching it a bit. And so it fits. And I'm going to use this as my little feature point to talk about. Uh, yes, $1.7 million. Thank you, California real estate. <laughs> um, but anyway, this came across and I wanted to check it out. I knew of the house. I knew the neighborhood. It's a great neighborhood. And I knew they had really dramatically remodeled it. I really wanted to check this house out. And my parents went with me and my dad had a little bit of a hard time up these steps. And, you know, as you are, when you're checking out a house, I'm just, you know, kind of adding that mentally to my list. I'm thinking, okay, well, I need to put a ramp in there. You know what, 15,000 maybe, 10,000? You, know, you, you, you know, as you do, you're adding up all these things. Okay, I guess I should you know, allocate about $10,000 to put a ramp in there. Um, there's plenty of room in that, in that front landscaping to just bang out a little ramp. Um, that'd be great, because otherwise, what am I gonna do? Hey, yeah, dad, I dropped 1.7 million on a house. Um, I'm hosting Thanksgiving. Uh, but you better stay at home because, you know, I know you had a hard time coming to the steps. I mean, what, what kind of a world are we creating for a $1.7 million house? Well, I researched this house. Bear with me here. This house was built in 1979, originally sold for $152,000. That's how it looked before the remodel. Uh, that it had a you know different stairway to that entry, still a stairway to that entry. It sold in 2007 booking a cold $500,000 profit. Uh, the ADA passed in between those two dates. And I imagine you might be jumping right ahead to, to my conclusion, <laughs> but to me, the, uh, the conclusion is obvious. Uh, the ADA passed right here. This house is worth half a million dollars more. I'm just saying, there's the money. The money's right there on the table. That is the money to make this particular residence accessible. Let's just add that on to the process of changing hands of a house. Um, that owner that bought it in 07 did all the extensive remodeling, redid the railing to that stairway, but still didn't put in a ramp. They were not required to put in a ramp. During both of those sales of the house, it was not required to have an ADA disclosure. There's a termite disclosure. There's a roof disclosure. I mean, the roof is leaking, by the way. They had to put that on the disclosure. They didn't have to put in writing not accessible entry. That's the crux of my argument here. If we just add this to real estate to at least get in writing, 
is this particular residence accessible at least to the front door? Can we at least get that in writing as a disclosure? That would be really handy, would not? I'd be able to search for that on Zillow. I can't even search on accessible on Zillow. And that is a, yet another comment on the ADA because of course someone's afraid to say accessible because is it, does it match the ultimate standards of ADA? Is there a rail in every toilet and so on, right? They're afraid to even bring up that word. But if you are looking for at least a way to get into a house without scurrying up a flight of stairs, good luck. And again, the money's there. Everyone always says, how will we pay for it? Does this look like the money's there? It looks like the money's there. The owner had to pay for the termite inspection, why not have the owner pay to make that entrance accessible? I don't know. That would be kind of cool if you ask me. Unless you think I was cherry picking. Turn around and it's every single house on the street. Maybe this was the style. You can see they're all built late 70s. I guess that was they wanted to make the entrance to a house an obstacle course. Um, but yeah, this is the issue with residential. Um, how do we approach, how do we solve this? And as you can see by kind of the numbers I'm putting on here, obviously that's the, I see the obvious solution. <laughs> the solution is the money's there. Whenever the money's there, just do it. It, it needs to be done. Um, so when is it? When are we going to add the basic ADA accessibility to residential? When are we going to do this? Um, certainly we aren't doing it for new construction, Still not happening. Um, and again, I wasn't cherry picking here either. I go, okay, what about new construction? I, again, I pulled up Zillow, changed my filter to new construction, clicked on the very first one I saw and I found this gem. <laughs> oh Lordy, how do you like this? Got to go up a half a flight of stairs to get in the front door. Once you come in the front door, you're in a stairwell. <laughs> wow, that's a, that's a gorgeous design come walk into a stairwell and you can either go down or you can go around and up to get to your common area. Um, uh, yeah, I've got some serious issues with this design. It, do you think this architect and this landscape architect know the ADA exists? Of course they do. Of course they've worked on projects that were accessible and they just kind of go, oh good, it's a single family house. I'll just forget all of that. I don't know. I mean, now, granted, there's the other issues, right? Look at both of these bathrooms, right? Three bathrooms, right? Probably none of these bathrooms are, are really big enough to be considered accessible. Um, you're trying to cram three beds and three baths into barely 1,800 square feet. Um, at the end of the day, that's what ADA has taught us, is that the, the, uh, the amount of square footage to accomplish anything is just simply larger than, than you know, basically, we've been doing it for hundreds of years. Right. Um, but how how do we get there? Obviously, like, you know, like I'm kind of saying, why can't the entrance to the common area be accessible? Because God forbid you buy a million dollar house and you go and get hip surgery. Right. The most common surgery in America or most common, you know, one of the most common. I mean, yeah, uh, it's 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 insane to think of that we are just creating all of this housing that's intractably unaccessible. So what can you do? You can do a lot, you know, we can all do a lot, but you are very, very well situated. And like I said, your discipline has embraced the ADA. Well, I, I would easily win that argument far more than any other discipline. You guys get it. So what can you do? Well, it's called inclusive design. You, you, you assess your design and you make your design accessible for everybody. And, and even this graphic is overcomplicating it. It's three things. You are assessing your design for mobility impairment, vision impairment, and hearing impairment. That's it. That's literally, that, that's how it relates to landscape architecture. That's all you gotta do. And bonus, it's trending right now. A cool video of your design could go viral on TikTok. That'd be kind of exciting, wouldn't it? 
you know, I found this, uh, you know, there's this new trend where they're putting Braille on these railing um, so you can enjoy the, the scenic view. Um, that's a nice touch. You are, you are making your design able to be appreciated by everybody. And why wouldn't you want that, right? Did you see this video about the kindergartner class? They learned uh, how to sing happy birthday song in sign language to surprise their deaf custodian. It's a really cute little video. However, yeah, I kind of wish instead of as a, as a stunt for TikTok, I kind of wish that they would just teach sign language in every kindergarten class. You know, that would be even better. But you, you have tools at your disposal. You have tools at your disposal you already use. You already assess your design for a whole list of things. You're checking to make sure it has the right, right fire code standards, the right parking standards, standards up the wazoo, right? You assess your design for a million different things. And in fact, how, how many times do you do this? How many times do you click that button right there in SketchUp to walk around the site, right? That's a standard thing you do. Well, right there in the bottom right corner of your screen is the camera height. There is nothing stopping you from just simply changing that camera height to three feet, four inches, and just check it out from that perspective. Hardly going to take any more time, right? Why not? You can hopefully avoid situations like this. This is insane to me. Uh, can you imagine how much money went into this crossing? Uh, you know, <laughs> the, the, you know, those crossing lights are not cheap. And, you know, I'm sure all the people involved, you know, they chose the correct color of green, you know, for that, for the bike path. Oh, those are those current standards for that. Oh, the, that is, by the way, that is an accessible crossing button. That's the, you know, the fancy new one. I'm sure those don't come cheap either. That's the one where, you know, you push it and it says, wait, 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 you know, one of those. Um, apparently, though, they forgot to notch this curb down. Uh, the hilarity of this to have an accessible crossing button, but an inaccessible curb to it. Uh, how did this happen? I mean, so, so what do we do here? We wait. We wait. Do we have to wait? So, you know, Aaron took this photo. Thank you, by the way, Aaron. Um, do we have to wait for Aaron to sue the city of Santa Cruz? Is that how we solve this? All I'm saying here is, yes, it was probably a civil engineer who signed off on this, but there might have been one of y'all landscape architects in that room. You might even have worked with them. You might have seen these plans. I know you see plans like this all the time. Can someone please step up and say, hey, hey, this is wrong. This is going to get the city sued. Okay, you got to fix this. Someone has got to be an advocate here. That's the crux of what, I, what I'm saying you can do. So let's, let's bring this home. Let's wrap it up. Let's think about the future. Let's think about we're 30 years in on the ADA, 30 years. What do you want to happen over the next 30 years? Are we going to address the ADA to residential in some fashion ever over the next 30 years? Can we please, please? What's going to happen over these next 30 years? Well, how about we got some options? I got three simple options for you. What do you think should happen with the ADA? How about option A, uh, get rid of it. Go back to the letting businesses do what they want. You know, if they want to be accessible, let them be accessible. You know, a nice libertarian answer, right? Um, obviously that's not going to happen. Okay, um, how about option B? Keep it the way it is. Just stop changing it. Stop changing these building codes every year. It's too hard to keep up with. Well. I, you know, I'm sorry if you've lost your energy for that, but I mean, you know, fire codes are going to continue to evolve. Um, you know, as, as we get some cool new product for a, a wheelchair lift that can fit in a residence, that's going to be awesome to have as a part of our, you know, tools at our disposal for our design and eventually our, our, our actual ADA codes. So no, that's not going to happen. It's going to continue to evolve. So is it option C then? continue to test the ADA by these court cases. And yeah, sure, maybe there'll be an additional law that'll, that'll come in and I'm ready for that. The wait, wait option, right? Wait, 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 wait. Or option D, how about option D? I'm gonna throw this one out. 
How about those actually building the future do the right thing? And let's make everything everywhere accessible. Is that really too much to ask? And I see things like this. I, I, I saw this uh, in San Jose, a $4 fee for all permits and licenses. And that funds a disability compliance program. It gives them a pot of money to pay for the inspections and compliance stuff. But it also gives them money to hand out as a grant up to $8,000 to a small business to put in a ramp. I think this is fantastic. This is so elegant. What's the number one problem of the ADA? Where's the money? Everyone always says that. Where's the money? Well, here's the money. You know, this is not perfect. Nothing in life or government is perfect. You know, oh, yes, it sucks to have every fee and permit $4 more. Yes, it really burns my gears that a business that 32 years in still doesn't have a ramp gets an $8,000 handout. That burns my gears a little. But again, this works. This addresses the fundamental problem, and it's extremely efficient. The money goes right to the department of the local government that is expressly interested in these different accessibility codes and violations. It's extremely efficient and elegant. You can fight for these in your communities. You can vote for these sorts of things and vote for these sorts of representatives who champion these. These are the things that you can do. You could also open your own creative mind and reimagine, reimagine what accessibility means to the future. You know, like I said, we've had multiple court cases that the accessibility cannot be separate. Separate is not equal. And this is ingenious. I love this. This is, this is kind of building in popularity, embedding the ramp into the stairway. It's really slick looking. I really like it. It's very cool. And, and this is something that you can do. And it feels a part of the design. That's always what you want. You want the landscape and the building to feel like it goes with the whole area. And you want the accessible entrance to just feel like part of the design. I saw this in Seattle. Actually, technically, I saw this in a presentation that, that uh, GGN did. Um, I tried to find some better photos. This was the best one I could. But what they've been exploring in Seattle is instead of dropping the, the curb, they've been raising the road to meet the level of the sidewalk. I think this is wildly ingenious. Uh, they've even raised the entire intersections. So imagine that whole intersection back here, raised the entire intersection to the level of the sidewalk. Um, it's, it's fantastic. Seattle's really having fun experimenting with it. Um, and to basically summarize, uh, you know, Shannon's speech that she gave on it is, you know, yes, you know, this is not, you know, quote unquote, proper ADA uh, code, you know, um, you know, you're supposed to, you know, drop the curb with the little yellow bumpy things and, and have your crossing. And so they're exploring this, they work with the city, they're like, hey, this is what we're thinking. We're thinking of doing this. And if you get the city to sign off on it, and you know what can happen, this can become adopted into your ADA building codes over time. You absolutely can help write these codes and write these future laws that guide the future of the ADA. You are ridiculously well situated to spearhead this movement going forward. And so we come to the end. Um, Maybe I've got you. <laughs> I hope I got you. Hope you're on board with me. Um, do I have you enough to repeat after me? Let's try it. I, as a landscape architect and steward of the earth, vow to do the following. I vow to always fight for disabled access on every project I work on. The disabled can't pick and choose. You're disabled all the time. Um, so can you fight for them all the time instead of picking and choosing? Do you vow to inform clients and owners of the benefits of inclusive design and the risks of neglecting it? Lawsuit, a changing, evolving ADA building code, making you jackhammer up everything and redo it the way it should have been in the first place? 
I vow to require full ADA access on every project, yes, residential, and will quit any job that does not. Can you have that commitment to be that advocate for the disabled on every project? Can you even go further? Do you vow to hire a disabled person? Just talk to a disabled person. Ask them what they need. Don't say, oh, I pull out this binder and it says to do this and I need to put this rail here and this rail here. Really? I mean, just try talking to, to some people and, and find out and push the bounds. Help craft this next generation of laws guiding accessibility. Because if I can leave you with one thought, it is this, everyone will be disabled at some point in their life. You know, you'll probably get hip surgery. You might get that knee surgery. You might get a car accident, ski accident. Could be something more horrific. You never know. Everyone, it's not an us versus them or anything like that. It's everyone. It's appreciating that just like the 14th Amendment said, yes, Blacks are citizens. We're saying, yes, the disabled are citizens. We're all citizens. We're all in this together. We're all one and the same. And I got some, if my words don't do it for you, here's some words from people much smarter than me. Um, in some cases, really holding back their, their lifetime of rage <laughs> at this, all we want is, is to just have the world be navigable and embrace us and be able to move around and do what we want and be a citizen and be a human and live our lives. So, um, gee, look at that. On that note, I am absolutely ready for some questions. Yeah, that was great, Jer. Um, uh, we got quite a few comments for sure i answered a few the best i could um jeff had just some great insight from a um the fact that he is on the asla ppc committee and access subcommittee hmm. and they just completed a guidebook to accessibility that is going to be available free to asla members soon oh fantastic so just to yeah. plug that one which is great um and they talk a little bit about um on accessibility it's not just ada but aba and universal accessibility and universal design is not necessarily code but just good design in general so um just keeping that in mind uh, it kind of hit home to a lot of the examples that you were talking about um i guess he was also trying to remember a back in the early 2000s the america planners association they produced a video it was a vh vhs video <laughs> <laughs> but uh it had visual and demonstration of why things like two percent cross slopes are important and, hmm. and accessibility to the real world wondering if anybody else uh, in the uh in the landscape industry have, has uh, heard of it or remembers what it is because uh hmm. he's just sort of checking on that one um he did have a question though about mm -hmm. the website stuff. Ah, yeah. Um, he's saying that most hardware and software providers have accessibility features built into their platforms and hardware. Um, is it as necessary for the websites to specifically be accessible or do these features just solve that issue? No, yeah, and it, it, it is, is, is because basically it, what, what it comes down to is um, you know, things like images. So if you have an image, um, um, you know, in the, in the actual HTML code of a website, um, the image could just say image, and then here's the source of the image. So how, how can that uh, web browser, what is it supposed to display for a vision impaired person? So it's literally just a matter of basically just adding the caption. You know, you don't have to add the caption, but you can right there built in the HTML. You can just embed the caption into that image. And so then that way their, their web browser will read out loud that caption of what that image is. And where it comes to a head is you can in HTML use an image as a button. And that was particularly the lawsuit against Southwest was they had um, images that were used as buttons that didn't have that embedded caption. So it was literally impossible to navigate because it would just say, you know, um, you know, uh, it'll just read out loud image used as button, 
no caption. Okay, tab to the next one. Image used as button. You know, and you're like, okay, I don't know which button says book a flight, right? So again, exceedingly easy to use, uh, exceedingly easily easy to do, to tell your team to do. So, you know, um, so that's just the comment on the websites. Yeah. Any other good questions? Um, yes. So th this is from uh, an anonymous chiming in, um, but they were commenting sort of on, on the whole uh, topic of the residential side and just being able to integrate the ramps and stuff like that, but, uh, and all the, the different stairwells and stuff like that and bringing to light the fact that the developers just want to max out the density. It makes it harder to mm -hmm. put things in like the ramps. They love to build the garage below and the one story and climb to get to the house mm -hmm. on those tight lots. So um, it really is just one of those priceless images to, to show that that's uh, a challenge, but trying to solve it even outside the box from the ramp side to know that there's those stair rail um, lifts and, and different things that obviously you mm -hmm. might need to integrate um, into that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, well, and again, and my comment on that is 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 just like with all of it, and I, I, I yeah, you know, thank you for that because that's true. It reminds me of something I wanted to say on that particularly, and I, and I really can't stress this enough. Um, yes, given that design requirement, let's just say on your garage ground floor level, you have a bedroom and a bathroom and a kitchenette that are all accessible. Is that really so hard? No, you know it's not. And how cool is that? That down on the garage floor, you have a kitchenette. You, this is now a huge bonus. And so now, you know, when you do get disabled, hopefully only temporarily or maybe whatever it is, or you have a friend or whatever, they at least can get in and make themselves a sandwich and use a bathroom and use it and, and have that area. So you absolutely can now, you to make the entire structure accessible in every room obviously that's a bridge too far that's not going to happen probably ever um but to say to have a requirement where there's at least a minimal accessible living area that is on the either at the ground level or with a, a lift up and that's where we also need new products we need these you know go to these expos and see if anyone is making you know residential grade wheelchair lifts i mean you know they exist maybe they're still pretty darn expensive um but there might be one that is the right price point and that works and is certainly less expensive than a full up elevator you know there are these solutions but like i said what what burns me is when you when we approach a solution to one of these it ends up being wildly appreciated like i said a kitchenette down at the garage you know grandma unit that would be so fantastic makes you it's even easy to rent out now it's extra income for you it's just the right thing to do and i think that's that's got to be my closing thought <laughs> yeah. do the right thing everyone <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll leave it with this too there's two more little comments um, about the raised roads um, mm. acting as traffic calming uh, you do get a lot of pushback in areas that need snow plowing, fire departments and stuff like mm. that, slowing mm -hmm. their access. So right. it really comes down to understanding the site, obviously the conditions that you're going to kind of trickle into different effects, um, obviously, but the grand scheme of things, and this, this will be the last part of it, is the first picture you showed. Um, mm -hmm where discussing the relationship between even historical buildings where it's not easy to integrate mm -hmm. to the design after the fact i still think there's there's something to be said that you can take a step back look at what those standards are look what you're trying to match and and make it a part of it, it i mean even though it's historical let's say that first picture was historical right it's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You sure. could have used different materials and done sure. it a little bit differently, but um, and kept the historical nature of it. But it just needs to be integrated more. It doesn't need to be an afterthought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And, and and that's the challenge. And that is the, the challenge of it. And that's our challenge looking forward. And like I said, I, I hope I maybe have inspired you guys a little bit. And um, on that note, thank you guys so, so much. And, um, you know, I hope to see you in person at uh, a future event. 
and all of that and be well and have a fantastic weekend. Thank you guys.